confirmation students and families. This is different, obviously. Um, we're going to be making some videos for confirmation for uh, as long as we need to be for the dealing with this uh, coronavirus uh, crisis that we're in, uh, with social distancing and the like. Obviously, we're doing some things differently. I hope that this uh, confirmation lesson in this way is helpful, is educational, is encouraging, um, is, is good for you guys as students and as family. Um, a little bit of word of encouragement before we get started with today's Lord's Supper lesson. Um, first and foremost, God is with you. Um, I've said this in a few other places. I keep coming back to Romans 8, uh, the end of Romans 8, where it says, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. And I, and I want you students especially to keep hearing those words because uh, nothing, not this virus, not isolation, um, not quarantine, not anything, not in exactly what the scripture says, nothing in this world, uh, not, not even angels or demons, will be able to separate you from the love of Jesus. So that means... The love of God is is for you today. Um, it'll be there for you tomorrow, and it'll be there for you every day to come. It is never going to be on hold, postponed, or canceled for you. With that encouragement, I, I want you guys to know uh, we love you. If you need anything, call me, text me, contact me in some way. Love to hear from you. Uh, but here we go with the lesson for today. We're covering Lord's Supper Lesson 3. It's going to be on pages 335 to 345 in your catechism. I encourage you as families to read through that together. There's a lot of scripture verses, even more than what we're going to kind of dive into specifically today, but there, there's there's a good content and there's also some good questions in there. I will have a, a little question sheet that I will email with to you uh, families as well that you guys can discuss uh, this content that I'm going to go over with you today. I encourage you to do that. Um, but primarily for our lesson today, we're going to be talking about uh, the power of the sacrament, what gives uh, the sacrament, uh, where does it get its power from, and we're going to be talking about how we receive it worthily. Um, there's uh, some concern and some blessing in the middle of that, um, and so we're going to dive into these two main concepts today. Prior to this, before spring break, before all of this virus stuff has kind of sprung up on us, at least here in the States, you guys will have already have heard from Pastor Davis uh, wonderfully about uh, sort of the, the nature of, of the sacrament, that it is both the body and blood as well as the bread and wine. Uh, at the same time, in a mysterious way, uh, he will have talked with you about that. It's called the real presence, just a good reminder for you. That is what we believe about the nature of the sacrament. And he also talked with you about the blessings, primarily, and in the, in the chief one there is the forgiveness of sins that God gives us to us every time we take the sacrament, every time we take the Lord's Supper. Um, and wherever there is forgiveness of sins, there's also the promise of life and salvation. And so those are the main blessings that come to us through the Lord's Supper. Uh, with that in mind, where it gets its power from? Uh, I guess, well, the, the, the quick, short, and obvious answer is Jesus and his words. But let's dive a little deeper into that. Um, where the Last Supper is recorded in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 26, uh, specifically looking at verses 26 through 28, it says this, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Um, no doubt that other times in confirmation class, you will have heard Pastor Davis say the words, uh, if God says so, it is so. Um, and this is true when God created the world, that when he said, let there be light, and let there be air, and let there be water, and land, and animals, um, and everything else other than us, because he shaped us by hand. When God said so, it is so. That is the power of God's spoken word, of his word. Jesus, as part of the Trinity, has that same power in his words as well. We see this not just in this spot. We see it in other parts of the scriptures. We see it in Mark chapter 4 and, and several of the other gospels where Jesus calms the storm. The winds and the, the storm is raging all around them. The disciples who are seasoned fishermen are freaking out. And they go and they get Jesus and says, <laughs> save us. Jesus says, be calm, quiet, be still. 
to the wind and the waves, and it all shuts down. It all calms down. That the spoken word of Jesus has that much power and effect over nature, over this world. And it is his words here that we, that we hear in this text that give us the, the understanding of, of where the power comes from in the sacrament, what makes it what it is. Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. And so we take Jesus at his word because if God says so, if Jesus says so, it is so. And so but that is, that is the power behind what it is, the nature of it. Um, but that main blessing that, uh, that we receive from it also comes from that verse in verse 28. Uh, reading it again. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Why again? For the forgiveness of sins. This is the, when we talk about baptism, it is the water and the word. When we talk about the Lord's Supper, it is the bread and the wine with the word um, and, and Christ's presence in this meal. And that blessing there in those words, that's how we know it has the power to do what it says it does. Because God says, do this, eat this, drink this, and the forgiveness of your sins is yours. So, just to reiterate, just to recap that simple point. Power of the sacrament, it comes from Jesus' words. Remember, if God says so, it is so. And that deals with the nature of it. But also, if God says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And that is the promise that God, that Christ has given you in this meal, in the Lord's Supper. So the next question is, how do we receive it worthily? And, and, and worthily, I don't know if that's language we really use, at least you guys use a lot. Uh, maybe rightly, um, properly, in the right way, in the best way. Um, that might be some better language in regards to that. Um, but when we talk, if we're going to use the word worthily, because that's what your, your catechism uses, um, we recognize that all of us, you, me, Pastor Davis, Everybody else, we are all sinful. In and of ourselves, we have no worthiness to come before our creator, our God, our savior, uh, except for the fact that Jesus calls us to. Um, because of our sin, we couldn't, but Jesus regularly welcomes sinners. We see it all throughout the gospels, all throughout the scriptures, that Jesus, that God regularly comes to and meets with sinners. And so he invites us to. And so it's not so much that our we are unworthy because of our sin, but that we are made right by God through what Jesus has done for us on the cross, and that he calls us by that gospel to come in faith to receive the Lord's Supper. And so, you know, essentially, it's Jesus and faith in Jesus that makes us worthy to come to the Lord's Supper. Um, but as far as practice, there are some instructions. Scripture speaks to this a little bit. There is a, a place in 1 Corinthians that talks about there's blessings but there's also some caution because we don't want that, that for some people that might do this, might take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. It's dangerous. It could be harmful to them. Um, but let me read the scripture for you. First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And there's that promise still of forgiveness that we hear back from Matthew. So, when, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, of sinning against Jesus. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. And so that, that judgment is a strong word. Um, and so essentially, we want to make sure that we do this in the right way, in the way that God wants us to do, in a way that is worthy both by, by who God has called us to be um, through faith in Christ, but also worthy in the right the right way the right practice and so there's a kind of a chart up here on the left is how do we partake of the lord's supper in a worthy way how do we receive it rightly and then there's 
what would be the reasons why somebody shouldn't receive it, why we would want to keep that from them. Um, and so, in a word, the right way, first and foremost, that we have faith in Jesus. If you believe something differently, if you don't have faith in Jesus, if you're of another religion, then we don't want you to take the Lord's Supper because, as Scripture says, you will drink judgment upon yourself. You will do harm to yourself, and we don't want you to do that. Secondly, um, the Lord's Supper, I wrote, it is what it is, and it does what it does. <laughs> and so that we believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus in, with, and under the bread and wine, that Christ's presence is truly there, all at the same time, yes, in a mysterious way, yes, in a way that our earthly human minds cannot fully comprehend, but we trust in Jesus' word. So we believe that it is what it is, and we also believe that it does what it does, that it, God actually gives us, it works through this meal, the means of grace, forgiveness of our sins. If you don't believe that the Lord's Supper does that, again, we wouldn't want you to take this meal at that time for the same caution. The last part is that we, we confess that, that we repent. But when we go to the Lord's Supper, when we prepare for the Lord's Supper, we ask ourselves questions. We ask ourselves these kind of questions. Do I believe in Jesus? Yes. Do I believe that Jesus died for me? Um, and, and, but also that in this meal that Christ is truly present. That in this meal we receive the forgiveness of sins. Yes. Um, but also we have this repentance piece that we, we take the Lord's Supper with us. That we also say that is it our desire after confessing our sins to God, recognizing that we're a sinner, that we need the forgiveness that the sacrament offers, that God is giving us, that we confess our sins and, and we ask God for forgiveness. And as part of any confession, we are also asking that God would help us to do better, to repent, to not just turn away from our sin, but to turn towards God, towards the right path. And with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we pray that we will be able to do that. But that we confess our sins and that we repent and strive to do right and better. Um, and so that is how we approach the Lord's Supper rightly. But also, if someone is unrepentant, if they don't think that their sin is that big of a deal, if they say, well, I, that's not really a sin, that, or I, I don't really care what God says, I'm going to do what I want anyway. If that's their attitude and they're being unrepentant, then again, for the same caution of that danger, of that drinking judgment upon oneself, we would not want them to take the Lord's Supper because we don't want them to be harmed through that meal. Same thing is true with holding grudges. If we are holding on to a grudge, in other words, if, if we say God has given, forgiven me for so much, but I don't want to forgive somebody else, then we are misunderstanding the magnitude of God's grace and mercy for us. Because if God is gracious and merciful to us, even in times when it's hard, we ought to do the same for others. And so scriptures speak towards we should not hold a grudge when coming, that we should actually deal with it. Our, 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 if we've sinned against our neighbor, if they've sinned against us, we really ought to go um, talk with them about it before we come up to the Lord's Supper. Um, the last thing I want to say, though, is to... In, in um, this will be probably be on a test, and it'll probably be an online test for the record. Um, but uh, the one of the things that we talk about is is uh, does everybody who comes up to the Lord's Supper receive the body and blood of Jesus? And I want you to hear that question because there's two really close questions, and the first one is that: Does everybody who comes up to the Lord's Supper receive the body and blood of Jesus? The second question is. Does everybody who come up, comes up to the Lord's Supper receive the blessings, namely forgiveness of sins, um, that, is, that God gives us through that meal? And so there are two different questions. They're really close together, but there's a, an important significance and distinction between the two. Does everybody who comes up to, to the Lord's Supper receive the body and blood of Jesus? Yes, everybody does, no matter what they believe, because my belief doesn't make it what it is. It is what it is because God says so. God has made it so. Jesus has said, this is my body, this is my blood. His words make it what it is, not my belief in it. So no matter what someone believes coming up to it, it is still the body and blood of Jesus. It still carries the same blessings and the same um, uh, concern if someone was coming in an unworthy manner with it. However, does everybody, the second question, does everybody who comes up to the Lord's Supper receive 
the blessings, namely the forgiveness of sin, of life and salvation, the strengthening of our faith. It, does everybody who comes up receive that? Well, only if they have faith in Jesus and in his words and promise. It's, it is only through faith that we receive those blessings. And we've been talking about that this whole year. We, we, we talked about the third article of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works through the means of grace, through his word, through his baptism, through his sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Um, God works through those things in our lives to give us that forgiveness. But that forgiveness comes to us through faith in Christ. That is the critical part. So with all that said in mind, uh, I am, am going to uh, give you this recording. I am going to uh, also give you, your family, again, a, a, a some sort of worksheet that has not a ton of questions, but a few questions you guys can discuss as a family. Love for you guys to, to look through that together, discuss that together, and give me some feedback because we might be doing this for the next month. And I want to know how to improve this process so that best benefits your family. Love you guys. God bless you. Take care.